Hey y'all, Aoki Historiker here, and today we're going to take a break from relevant labor history and talk about the experience of a warehouse man, specifically me. For a brief period of time in the winter of 2017, I used to work in the food warehouse of an NBA team, and needless to say, it was one of the worst job experiences I've ever had. So much so that it was one of the biggest influences on me becoming an anarchist. While I won't mention which team I worked for, I do want to talk about my experiences there and the effect it had on me. Let me first explain. I hate working with food mainly because of the sausage principle, but also because working in a food warehouse comes with a bunch of downsides as I'll explain in a moment. But before that, let's talk about the positives. The biggest positive was watching basketball players practice for upcoming games, ones they usually lost, watching games at court level even if it was from 50 feet away, and often working close to celebrities. Most people will never have Jay-Z walk past them at their job or serve CeeLo green drinks. More often than not, I got to see the best player on our team who would actually give a lowly peasant like me a nod. I'm glad he's with a much better team now. Some other positives were getting free lunch every day, which usually was pretty well made even if it was sometimes just hot dogs. And that was about it. The rest of the job varied from okay to downright awful. Let me take you on a quick journey on how we got the stadium food from the truck to your mouth. First, the food was delivered to us by a food distributor. Our main food distributors were okay, thankfully not one of the worst ones in the industry, though occasionally we would receive pallets that weren't correctly built and would fall over. Because we often had multiple events a week, every day we got about 2-3 to three deliveries. Putting away and rotating frozen fruit was always amongst the worst tasks for me, because I hate working in cold environments and freezers mess with my eczema, to the point where I needed to use a special cream to keep my skin from getting irritated. Taking care of alcohol deliveries was a pain, as it often involved heavy lifting, especially on the occasion we had to deal with kegs. Moving several 160-pound kegs on a cart and then lifting them even just 6 inches into the freezer was probably the hardest part of the job for me, as it always left my muzzle stinging. After all deliveries were handled, I spent the rest of the time filling orders for the various stands within the stadium. A supervisor would build these orders on a cart, often stacking products 6 feet high. Then I would have to push one cart and pull another to their stands and unload them. If you have ever been to a basketball stadium, then you are familiar with how big they are. Now imagine pushing one cart and pulling another, each weighing nearly a couple hundred pounds throughout the entire complex. More often than not, my supervisors would throw the carts together improperly, and on more than one occasion, I dropped large jars of pickles on the floor. In fact, you could actually still see the pickle stains at the stadium today as of 2020. The stand settled everything else on event days, though if they ran out of food or a keg needed to be changed, I would have to make deliveries, snaking my way through thousands of drunk buzzing fans with a small rickety cart. By the way, as most of you know, never buy food or drinks at a sporting event because they are ripping you off. Thing is, you probably don't realize how bad they are actually ripping you off. A burger there costs $10.75, the price being conveniently left off the website. This is obviously because they don't want you to eat before you come to the stadium. This doesn't include fries or a drink, mind you, just the burger itself. McDonald's only charges you $5 and some change for a burger, fries, and a drink, which tastes better than the bland, mushy stadium burger. Alcoholic beverages are even worse. You'll pay $15 for a 25-ounce can of beer that maybe costs, what, $2 at a convenience store? And costs us less than a dollar. Considering that food prices were the biggest complaint we received, perhaps one day sports fans and gamers alike will understand how capitalism ruins their favorite pastime. Anyway, despite how physically difficult the job was, that wasn't really what made me hate the job. Compared to the positives, these negatives weren't too bad for me, and I could often finish the job rather quickly and got to go home early so I could beat rush hour traffic. No, the two things that made me hate the job were the awful pay and the management. The pay was not great. I made $10 an hour there, which was more than my state's minimum wage and about average considering that most food warehouse jobs I saw at the time paid that much. However, when you take into account that parking was roughly $10 a day, you technically don't earn anything for your first hour of work. The first hour there, you basically worked for free. Also, on average, I worked 34 to 37 hours a week, 6 to 7 days a week, meaning that $60 to $70 of my income went towards parking every week. Often my supervisors, who made $14 an hour, wanted to complete the job as quickly as possible, in roughly about 5 hours. I always tried to take as much time as possible because working so few hours would have made it impossible for me to afford anything. In fact, I didn't make enough money to really afford rent. The insultingly low wages for the physically demanding workload showed just how little respect anyone above me had for the rank and file co-worker, and this leads me to the worst part of the job. I'm an anarchist, so naturally we gotta talk about hierarchy. The management was by far the worst. 
When it came to the stadium's hierarchical structure, at the top naturally you had the executives within the team itself. These were the people who you were to never approach unless they spoke to you first. Most of them avoided all contact with anyone who wasn't an executive or an executive assistant. This went as far as avoiding eye contact with us and purposely taking inconvenient routes to avoid having to walk near us, even on the days when the public weren't present. Many would in fact walk an extra 80 feet just to not have to use the same elevator as us, and would even have their assistants bring them lunch from the kitchen. As a result, I didn't see them much and honestly their jobs were still a mystery to me. Below the executives were the handful of people whose job it was to uphold the team's image and by extension make sure that the rank and file workers of the food catering company, the cleaning company, etc. were doing their jobs professionally and making the team look good. Typically people within the company called them the demagogues. They were basically a third boss but they had even more authority than my manager or even the director of operations within my company. What did they do with this authority you ask? Well, they mainly just walked the halls inspecting our work, like our supervisors were already doing, but these people would hold us to a much higher standard. However, for them, appearance was much more important than function. As long as the operation looked good, it wasn't a big deal if something was inefficient. These people paid so much attention to outward appearance that they tried to ban us from wearing jackets because they did not have the team's logo on them. We often worked in freezers for extended periods of time outside in 30 degree weather and they actually tried to ban us from using jackets. Eventually they compromised with us by forcing us to buy jackets with logos on them. I was supposed to return those jackets according to the rules but since I paid for them I decided to keep them. They were also our quote unquote spirit leaders or in non-corporate speak it was their job to inspire us to do our jobs to the best of our ability. The main way they did this was by talking about how the team's majority owner was a famous celebrity and that it was a privilege to work for him. They encouraged us to work in a way that would impress this person despite the fact that this person never actually attended games. Below them was HR and security, who naturally enforced the rules of the stadium and patrolled the halls to ensure that no one was in any of the restricted areas. Security, however, took this a step further than their job description by often checking up on workers stopping us and asking us what we were doing and why we were entering certain parts of the stadium, even to people who had been there for several years. I got these little checkups for weeks until I started giving some of the security officers free drinks, after which point they started leaving me alone. NBA refs also had their own security, and one of the security officials once actually told me that I was not supposed to walk past refs because it was rude, but I just ignored her and kept on walking. By that point, I really didn't care if I kicked the hive. Funnily enough, I never got into any trouble for that, despite the fact that disrespecting NBA officials was a major offense. HR, while necessary to maintaining a healthy workplace, did not enforce the rules equally across the entire stadium. Complaints against workers and supervisors almost always resulted with write-ups, while complaints against management and chefs never seemed to stick. One chef had so many harassment complaints dismissed, several workers threatened to take the company to court, but as far as I know, he was never reprimanded. Despite all that, if there was a problem, I was encouraged to rely on these people for help, but typically I just took matters into my own hands. Then there was the management directly above me, my supervisors and my managers. The lack of respect I got from these people was the last straw for me. The day I quit, my boss was snapping at us like dogs, attempting to get us to complete last minute tasks that had been thought up early that morning. But that was far from the only time something like that happened. It was often the case that my manager and his boss would throw together something last minute and have us figure out how we were going to get the task done on time. I often complained that we needed sufficient time to properly implement new ideas, but these complaints fell on deaf ears. I mean, why would he listen to someone who made less than a fifth of his salary? And speaking of, why did he need to make that much money? I mean, sure, he took care of the orders and the paperwork that got the food there in the first place, but I moved the food to the places where it could be cooked and sold. I made sure that the kegs were changed promptly and delivered liquor to bars. And yet apparently my boss was doing five times the amount of work that I was doing. Though, in reality, he really wasn't. This was also the case for supervisors. Almost daily, supervisors would pass on tasks to me that they simply did not want to do, all while sitting at their desks and listening to the radio. And naturally at the bottom was the rank and file co-worker who did some of the hardest yet most important jobs for the lowest wages. Even worse, most made so little that they had to work another job. It wouldn't be until well after I left that I realized the social structure within the stadium wasn't too different from that of our current capitalist society. However, this job did give me my first clear memorable experience of seeing capitalism for what it truly is. This eye-opening moment. The moment that I truly started to critically question capitalism was on one average Thursday. 
I was moving two heavy carts to a service elevator when one of the executives walked past me and headed towards the parking lot, presumably to get into his Mercedes SL65 AMG Black. Based on what I overheard from another executive, that man made nearly $20 million a year not counting bonuses. And in that moment, it hit me. This person did not deserve to make $20 million a year while many of us didn't even make $20,000 a year. He did not contribute that much more to the stadium than us to deserve a very comfortable lifestyle while others could not even afford to put their children through school. Fulfilling the requests of people who make several times the meager wages is one thing, but spending every day seeing and walking by executives of my company who made several times my yearly income was just simply demeaning. Seeing executives get in their Mercedes Benz they bought with my stolen surplus value while I could barely afford to pay bills and buy food, it was dehumanizing. It makes you question your worth as a person. Question what you did wrong to end up there, rather than a system that allows and encourages your exploitation. And I couldn't take it. I quit that job as soon as I found a better one. But I always think back to those who, for various reasons, are stuck employed there. And I'm not free. I'm still stuck in the same capitalist society. The difference is, is that my current job is decent and I don't work near multimillionaires anymore. I want things to be better. But I don't want to move up the pyramid. I don't want to exploit workers, or help others exploit workers. I want to destroy the pyramid. I want to supplant capitalism, and at the end of the day, I'm glad that I worked that shitty MBA job, because I never would have understood capitalism for what it truly is. And now that I'm aware of what's going on, I feel it's important to share with others what I've learned. For if I truly want to supplant capitalism, I'm going to need a lot of help. In fact, I need the entire help of the united working class. But before that's possible, we need to educate the working class on how capitalism negatively affects them and how, only through supplanting capitalism, can we improve the condition of the working class. Thanks for watching. I got the idea to make this video from Hardcore Lime, and you should check out his video on why the left should care about sports because there is much more to the intersection of sports and politics than many leftists give credit. Rather than plug other content creators, I want to encourage other leftist YouTubers to make videos about their awful past work experiences. Thought Slime has made a couple of videos like these already, and I think these videos resonate with people because most of the people who watch our content are working people and understand the struggle. YouTubers like Fantavision do similar things on their channels, and often unintentionally come close to showing how capitalism negatively affects the workplace, but they never quite get there. If we want more people to see how capitalism allows a select few to prosper while exploiting the working class, sharing our own personal experiences lets others know that they are not alone in their struggle, and most importantly, there is a way out. Anyway, the next labor video is on its way, and this time we're talking about a major pre-Civil War strike. Catch y'all then.